I'm Lister Sinclair, and this is Ideas. The 1996 Massey Lectures scheduled for this week will not be heard. In their place, we present a rebroadcast of the 1990 Massey Lectures, entitled Biology as Ideology, The Doctrine of DNA, by Richard C. Lewinton. Last night, Professor Lewinton focused on the role of genes in contemporary medical research. He claimed that because of its reductionist approach to research, science has tried to reduce complex phenomena to simple causes. These days, the favoured cause has been the gene. Genes are now thought to be the cause for almost every human trait, be it physical or mental. So while in the past, scientists thought genetic disorders were relatively rare, today they claim that almost everything that ails humans, from high blood pressure to cancer to alcoholism, has a genetic cause. And since the mid-1970s, a new discipline called sociobiology has gone one step further. It's attempted to locate the cause for social phenomena in the gene as well. Sociobiologists claim, for example, that societies are naturally competitive, aggressive, hierarchical and individualistic because individuals are naturally competitive, aggressive, hierarchical and individualistic that these traits are coded in our genes. Professor Lewinton's work as an evolutionary biologist has led him to dispute these claims. He believes that rather than being based on science, they are ideologically driven. Tonight, Professor Lewinton continues with part four of Biology as Ideology, the Doctrine of DNA. The claim that all of human existence is controlled by our DNA is a popular one. This has the effect of legitimizing the structures of society in which we live, because it does not stop with the assertion that differences in temperament, ability, physical and mental health between us are coded in our genes. It also goes on to say that the political structures of society itself, the competitive, entrepreneurial, hierarchical society in which we live, and which deferentially rewards different temperaments, different cognitive abilities, different mental attitudes, that that social structure is also determined by our DNA, and that it is therefore unchangeable. For after all, even if we were biologically different from one another, that in itself would not guarantee that society would give different power and status to people who are different. To make the ideology of legitimacy complete, we have to have a theory of unchangeable human nature, a human nature that's coded in our genes. Every political philosophy has to begin with a theory of human nature. Surely, if we cannot say what it is to be truly human, we cannot argue for one or another form of social organization. Social revolutionaries especially must have a notion of what it is to be truly human, because the call for revolution is the call for the spilling of blood and for a wholesale reorganization of the world. One can hardly call for a violent overthrow of what is, without claiming that what will be is more in accord with the true nature of human existence. So, even Karl Marx, whose whole view of society was an historical one, nevertheless believed that there was a true human nature and that human beings realized themselves in their essence by a planned social manipulation of nature for human welfare. The problem for political philosophers has always been to try to justify their particular view of human nature. Before the 17th century, the appeal was made to divine wisdom. God had made people in a certain way. Indeed, they were made in God's image, although perhaps a blurred one. And moreover, human beings were basically sinful from the time of Adam and Eve's fall. But modern secular technological society cannot draw its political claims from divine justification. From the 17th century onward, political philosophers have tried to create a picture of human nature based on some sort of appeal to a naturalistic view of the world. Thomas Hobbes, in his Leviathan, which argued for the necessity of the king, built a picture of human nature from the simplest axioms about the nature of human beings as organisms. To Hobbes, in the 17th century, human beings, like other animals, were self-enlarging, self-aggrandizing objects that simply had to grow and occupy the world. But the world was a place of finite resources, 
And so it necessarily would happen that human beings would come into conflict over those resources as they expanded. And the result would be what he called the war of all against all. The conclusion for Hobbes was that one needed a king to prevent this war from destroying everything. The claim that organisms, especially human beings, grow without bound, and that the world in which they grow is finite and limited, are the two basic claims that have given rise to the modern biological theory of human nature. They resurfaced again in the Reverend Malthus treatment on population and his famous law that organisms grow geometrically in numbers while the resources for their subsistence only grow arithmetically. So again, a struggle for existence must occur. As we all know, Darwin took over this notion of nature to build his theory of natural selection. Since all organisms are engaged in a struggle for existence, those that are better suited by their shape and form, by their physiology, by their behavior, to leave more offspring in that struggle and to survive will do so. And the consequence will be that their kind will take over the world. The Darwinian view is that whatever human nature may be, it, like everything else about humans, who are after all living organisms, has evolved by natural selection. Therefore, what we truly are is the result of two billion years of evolution from the earliest rudimentary organism up to us. As evolutionary theory has developed over the last 100 years and become technologically and scientifically sophisticated, as vague notions of inheritance have become converted into a very precise theory of the structure and function of DNA, so, the evolutionary view of human nature has developed a modern, very scientific-sounding apparatus that makes it seem every bit as unchallengeable as the theories of divine providence seemed in an earlier age. What has happened in effect is that Thomas Hobbes' war of all against all has been converted into a struggle between DNA molecules for supremacy and dominance over the structure of human life. The most modern form of naturalistic human nature ideology is called sociobiology. It emerged onto the public scene a little over 15 years ago and has since become the ruling theory for justifying the permanence of society as we know it. It's an evolutionary theory and it's a genetic theory using the entire theoretical apparatus of modern evolutionary biology, including a great deal of abstruse mathematics which is then translated for the inexpert reader in coffee table books with beguiling pictures and in magazine articles and newspaper accounts. Sociobiology is the latest and most mystified attempt to convince people that human life is pretty much what it has to be and perhaps even what it ought to be. The sociobiological theory of human nature is built in three steps. The first is an actual description of what human nature is like. One looks around at human beings and tries to build a fairly complete description of the features that are said to be common to all human beings, in all societies, in all places, and at all times. The second step in this naturalistic evolutionary theory of human nature is to claim that those characteristics which appear to be universal in humans are in fact coded in their genes, that is, in their DNA. We need for this purpose genes for religiosity, genes for entrepreneurship, genes for whatever characteristics are said to be built into the human psyche and human social organization. These two claims, that there is a universal human nature and that it is coded in the genes and is unchangeable, would, I suppose, be sufficient as a biological theory of human nature in a purely descriptive sense. This is what we are, take it or leave it. But sociobiological theory, being built on evolutionary theory, goes one step further, as it must to fulfill its program. It has to explain, and in some sense justify, how we got to have these particular genes, rather than some other genes that might have given us quite a different human nature. We then have the third step, which is to claim that natural selection, through the differential survival and reproduction of different kinds of organisms, has led inevitably to the particular genetic characteristics that we have and that are said to form society. This claim strengthens the argument of legitimacy because it says that not only are we a certain way, but there's no other way we could have been. 
given the universal law of the struggle for existence and the survival of the fittest. In this sense, the sociobiological theory of human nature puts on a mantle of universality and of utter fixity. After all, if two billion years of evolution have made us what we are, do you really think that a hundred days of revolution will change us? So how do sociobiologists go about taking the first step, the claimed correct description of what is universal in all human beings? They do it more or less as every human nature theorist has done it, by looking around to see what people around them are like, and to some extent by telling their own life histories. Having looked inward at themselves and outward at modern capitalist society for a description of human nature, they then extend it a bit further by looking into the anthropological record in order to assure us that those very same elements that they find in the 20th century American and British societies are also in one form or another displayed by the Stone Age people of New Guinea. For some reason, they do not look much at the historical record of European society, of which they seem to be quite ignorant. Uh, but perhaps they feel that if New Guinea Highlanders and Scottish Highlanders show the same characteristics today, then there can't have been much change in the last 1,500 years of recorded history. And what are these human universals that sociobiologists find? Well, one can hardly do better than look at the most influential and, in some sense, founding document of sociobiological theory, a book by my colleague at Harvard, Professor E.O. Wilson, called Sociobiology, the New Synthesis. Professor Wilson tells us, for example, that human beings are indoctrinable. He says, human beings are absurdly easy to indoctrinate. They seek it. They're also characterized by blind faith. Men would rather believe than know. The statement that men would rather believe than know is, we must note, found in what is called a scientific work, used as a textbook in courses all over the world, filled with the mathematics of modern population biology, crammed with observations and facts about the behavior of all kinds of animals, based on what Time magazine has called the iron laws of nature. But surely, men would rather believe than know, is more in the line of barroom wisdom. You know, I go to the pub and I turn to my friend and I say, well, you know, men would rather believe than know. Among other aspects of human nature are said to be universal spite and family chauvinism. We're told that human beings are keenly aware of their own bloodlines and have the intelligence to plot intrigue. Xenophobia, the fear of strangers, is supposed to be part of our universal equipment. According to Professor Wilson, part of man's problem is that his intergroup responses are still crude and primitive and inadequate for the extending territorial relationship that civilization has thrust upon him. One of the results of this is genocide and warfare. So, we're told that the most distinctive human qualities have emerged during the phase of social evolution that occurred through intertribal warfare and through genocide. And then, of course, there's a relationship between the sexes. Male dominance and superiority is part of human nature. So Wilson writes that, among general social traits in human beings are aggressive dominance systems, with males dominant over females. This list I've given is not complete, nor is this simply the idiosyncratic view of one influential sociobiologist. The claims that human warfare, sexual dominance, love of private property, hate of strangers are all human universals are found over and over again in the writings of sociobiologists, whether they be themselves biologists, economists, psychologists, or political scientists. But in order to make such claims, one must be quite blind even to the history of European society. Take, for example, the claim of a universal xenophobia. In fact, the attitudes of people toward foreign cultures and other countries has been one which has varied tremendously from social class to social class and from time to time. Could the aristocracy of Russia in the 19th century, which thought all things Slavic to be inferior, which spoke French by preference, which looked to Germany for its military and technological resources, could that be described as xenophobic? Educated and upper classes in particular have often looked to other cultures for the highest and the best. I'm occasionally interviewed by Italian radio and television. 
and the answers I give to their questions about science are then translated into Italian, which the listeners hear in a voiceover after a few moments of my English. When I ask the producers why they don't simply get an Italian scientist to do the program, they tell me that Italians simply don't believe any claims about science that are made in Italian, and that they have to hear it in English if they're going to believe it's true. Nothing better reveals the narrow ahistorical claims of sociobiological description than the standard discussion of the economy of scarcity and unequal distribution by political scientists and economists when they are arguing in the sociobiological mode. Professor Wilson said that the members of human societies sometimes cooperate closely in insectin fashion. Note the word insectin. But more frequently, they compete for the limited resources allocated to their role sector. The best and the most entrepreneurial of the role actors usually gain a disproportionate share of the rewards, while the least successful are displaced to other less desirable positions. But this description completely ignores the immense amount of sharing of resources that occurs among a whole variety of modern hunting and gathering societies like Eskimos. And it certainly completely distorts the history even of Europe. The concept of entrepreneurship does not work for, say, uh, the 13th century in the Ile de France, which was an agrarian, feudal society in which land could not be bought and sold, in which labor could not be hired and fired, and in which the so-called market mechanism was only a rudimentary form of exchange of a few goods. Of course, sociobiologists recognize that there are exceptions to these generalizations, but their claim is that these exceptions are temporary and unnatural and that they will not persist in the absence of constant force and threat. So societies may indeed, like blue-clad, regimented Chinese, cooperate in insectin fashion. But this can only be managed by constant supervision and force. The moment one relaxes one's vigil, people will revert to their natural ways. It's rather as if we could make a law saying that everyone would have to walk on their knees, which would be physically possible but terribly painful. The moment we relaxed our vigil, everybody would stand upright again. At the surface of this theory of human nature is the obvious ideological commitment to modern, entrepreneurial, competitive, hierarchical society. But underneath is a deeper ideology, and that is the priority of the individual over the collective. Despite the name sociobiology, we are not dealing with a theory of social causation, but of individual causation. The characteristics of society are seen as caused by the individual properties that its members have. And those properties, as we shall see, are said to derive from their genes. If human societies engage in war, that's supposed to be because each individual in society is aggressive. If men as a group dominate women, or whites dominate blacks, it's because each man, as an individual, is supposed to be desirous of dominating each woman, and every white person must have feelings of personal hostility set off by the sight of a black skin. The structures of society simply reflect these individual predispositions in the sociobiological view. Society is nothing but the collection of individuals in it, just as culture is seen as nothing but the collection of disarticulated bits and pieces, individual preferences and habits. But such a view completely confuses, partly by linguistic confusion, very different phenomena. Look, it's obviously not the case that Britain and Germany made war on each other in 1914 because individual Britons and individual Germans felt aggressive. If that were the case, we would not have to have had conscription. English, Canadians, American soldiers killed Germans and vice versa because the state put them in a position that made that inevitable. A refusal to be conscripted meant a jail term, and the refusal to obey orders in the field meant death before a firing squad. Great machines of propaganda, martial music, stories of atrocities are manufactured by the state in order to convince its citizens that their lives and the chastity of their daughters are at risk in the face of the threat by barbarians. The confusion between individual aggression and national aggression is a confusion between the rush of hormones that I might feel if the producer of this program walked up to me and slapped me in the face, 
and a national political agenda that's meant to control natural resources, lines of commerce, prices of agricultural goods, and the availability of labor forces that are really the origins of warfare between states. It's important to realize that one doesn't have to have a particular view of the content of human nature to make this error of individuals causing society. Prince Pyotr Kropotkin, a famous anarchist and indeed the founder of modern anarchism, also claimed that there was a universal human nature, but that that human nature was one that would create cooperation and would be anti-hierarchical if only it were allowed free play against the dominance and oppressiveness of the state. But his theory was no less a theory of the dominance of the individual as a source of the social than is the modern sociobiological theory. Having once described a universal set of human social institutions that are said to be the consequence of individual natures, sociobiological theory then goes on to claim that those individual properties are coded in our genes. There are said to be genes for entrepreneurship, for male dominance, for aggressivity. So conflict between the sexes or between parents and offspring are said to be genetically programmed. What's the evidence that those claimed human universals are in fact in our genes? Well, often it's simply asserted that because they're universal, they must be genetic. A classic example is in the discussion of sexual dominance. Professor Wilson has written in the New York Times, in hunter-gatherer societies, men hunt and women stay at home. This strong bias persists in most agricultural and industrial societies. Apparently, the professor is not caught up with women in the workforce yet. And on that ground alone appears to have genetic origin, he says. This argument confuses the observation with its explanation. If the circularity is not obvious to you, you might consider the claim that since 99% of Finns are Lutherans, they must have a gene for it. A second evidence offered for the genetic determination of human universal traits is the claim that other animals show the same traits and that therefore we must have a genetic continuity with them since we descended from animal-like ancestors in evolution. Ants are described as making slaves and having queens. But the slavery of ants knows nothing about the auction block, about whips and overseers of buying and selling, of the essentially commodity nature of the slave relationships in human societies. Indeed, ant slaves are almost always of other species, and ant slavery has a great deal more in common with the domestication of animals than it does with slavery. Nor do ants have queens. The force-fed egg factory encased in a special chamber in the middle of an ant colony that's called a queen has no resemblance to the life of either Elizabeth I nor Elizabeth II, nor of their different political roles in society. This confusion between qualities of animals and qualities of human society is an example of the problem in biology of homology and analogy. By homologous traits, biologists mean those properties of organisms which in fact are shared by different species because they have a common biological origin and evolution and some common biological genetic ancestry and that they derive from common features of anatomy. Even though they look very different and are used for very different purposes, for example, the bones of a human arm and of a bat's wing are homologous because they're anatomically derived from the same structures and influenced by the same genes. On the other hand, a bat's wing and an insect's wing are only analogous. That is, they look superficially alike and they seem to serve the same function, but they have no origin in common at the genetic or morphological or evolutionary level. But of course analogy is in the eye of the observer. How do we decide that slavery in ants and ant queens are like human slavery and like human royal families? How do we decide that the coyness we see in people is the same as the behavior in animals that sociobiologists call coyness? What happens in fact is that human categories are laid on animals by analogy and then suddenly these traits are discovered in animals and laid back on humans as if they had a common origin. When human beings look at animals, indeed when human beings look at any aspect of the world, they search in human experience and especially human social experience, not only for the words that they use, but for the concepts themselves. How else can human beings see ant society except as human society writ small? 
there is in fact not a shred of evidence that the anatomical, physiological, and genetical basis of what's called aggression in rats has anything at all in common with the German invasion of Poland in 1938. The third set of evidence that's presented for the genetic basis of human social behavior is the report of heritability of human traits. So such characteristics as introversion and extroversion, personal tempo, psychomotor and sports activities, eroticism, dominance, depression, and even conservatism and liberalism are said to be heritable. But the evidence for the heritability of these traits is totally absent. We must remember that genetics is a study of similarity and difference between relatives. We judge things to be heritable if close relatives are more alike than our distant relatives or unrelated persons. But the problem in human genetics, in particular, is that similarity between relatives arises not only for biological reasons, but for cultural reasons as well, since members of the same family share the same environment in nuclear families. This has always been the problem of human genetics whether we are talking about traits of personality or even of anatomy. Most reports of the heritability of personality traits are in fact simple observations that parents and children resemble each other in some respect. We must remember that the highest similarity between parents and offspring for social traits in North America is for political party and religious sect. Yet no serious person believes in genes for Anglicanism or voting NDP. The observation of similarity of parents and offspring is not an evidence of their biological similarity. There's a confusion here between the observation and the possible causal explanations. The fact is, not a single study of personality traits in human populations has successfully disentangled similarity because of shared family experience from similarity because of genes. So, in fact, we know nothing about the heritability of human temperamental and intellectual traits that are supposed to be the basis for social organization. But there's even a deeper problem. In order to carry out a heritability study, even a correct one, we require differences between individuals. All of genetics is a study of differences. If everyone were identical in some respect, that is, if everybody had exactly the same genes for some characteristic, then there would be no way to investigate its heritability because genetic investigations require contrast between individuals. Sociobiological theory claims that all human beings share genes, the same genes, for aggression, for xenophobia, for male dominance, and so on. But if we all share these genes, if evolution has made us all alike in this genetically determined human nature, then in principle there'd be no way to investigate the heritability of the traits. On the other hand, if there's genetic variation among human beings in these respects, then on what basis do we declare that one or another manifestation is universal human nature? If it's genetically determined that we're aggressive and like to go to war, then we have to suppose that A.J. Musty, the famous pacifist who spent a good part of his adult life in prison, lacked this gene and was therefore in some sense less than human. If, on the other hand, he possessed the gene but was a pacifist anyway, the gene seems somewhat less than all-powerful in determining behavior. Why aren't we all like A.J. Musty? There are deep contradictions in the simultaneous assertion that we're all genetically alike in certain respects and that our genes are all powerful in determining our behavior and at the same time observing that people differ. Finally, there's an extraordinary naivete and ignorance of the principles of developmental biology involved in assertions that genes make us behave in particular ways in particular circumstances. DNA functions in several ways in influencing the development of organisms. First, the exact sequence of the amino acids in our proteins is coded in our genes, but no one would suggest that the amino acid sequence for a particular protein in itself can make us liberal or conservative. Second, genes influence when in the course of development and in which part of the body particular proteins are to be produced, and this in turn influences cell division and cell growth. So it might be claimed that there's a fixed pattern of neurons in our central nervous system, influenced by the turning on and turning off of genes during development, that makes us warlike or pacifist. But this would require a theory of the development of the central nervous system that makes no allowances for developmental accidents and little or no role for the creation of mental structures by experience. 
Yet even the rudimentary social organization of ants, with their structure of work and inter-individual relations, that is so simple as compared with ours, is very flexible with respect to information from the external world. Even ant colonies change their collective social behavior over time, and depending on how long the colony has occupied a given territory. It takes an enormous set of assumptions to suppose that this human central nervous system, with thousands of times more nervous connections than in any ant, has completely stereotyped and fixed genetic responses to circumstances. The incredible variety of human social circumstances would require an amount of DNA that we simply don't possess. There's enough human DNA to make about 250,000 genes, but that would simply be insufficient to determine the incredible complexity of human social organization, except in its most general outlines. Once we admit that these outlines are only general, however, then we have to allow immense flexibility depending on particular circumstances. The final step in the sociobiological argument is to say that the genes we possess for universal human nature have been established in us through evolution by natural selection. That is, once upon a time, human beings varied genetically in the degree to which they were aggressive, xenophobic, indoctrinable, male-dominated, and so on. But those individuals who were most aggressive or most male-dominant left more offspring. So the genes that were eventually left in us as a species were the ones that now determine these traits. The argument of natural selection seems a fairly simple and straightforward one for some kinds of traits. For example, it's argued, the more aggressive of our ancestors would leave more offspring because they would swoop down on the less aggressive ones and eliminate them. The more entrepreneurial ones would have grabbed more resources and starved out the wimps. In each case, it's easy to make up a plausible story that would explain the superior reproductive abilities of one type over another. Oh, but then there are some traits that are said to be universal and don't lend themselves so easily to this story of individual reproductive advantage. One example, and it's one that's discussed a great deal by sociobiologists and regarded by them as the triumph of sociobiological reasoning, is the problem of altruistic behavior. Why should we be cooperative under some circumstances? Why should we sometimes give up what appear to be immediate advantages, even reproductive advantages, for the benefit of others? To explain this, sociobiologists discuss the theory of kin selection. In order for us to pass genes to future generations and so have them increase in evolution, it's not necessary for us as individuals to pass on our own genes, provided that our brothers and sisters, who share half of our genes because of common ancestry, could pass on their genes to future generations. So if we could behave in a cooperative or even altruistic way, that would increase the number of offspring that our brothers and sisters would have, we could afford to give up our own reproduction and even our own survivorship. My kinds of genes would increase indirectly through the increase of genes of my relatives. In this indirect way, I would be leaving more offspring. This is the phenomenon of what ornithologists call helpers at the nest in birds, in which it is said that non-reproductive birds help out their close relatives, who are then able to raise more than the ordinary number of offspring, and in the end, more family genes are left. To make this work, if you give up your own reproduction, your brothers and sisters have to have twice as many offspring as ordinarily, but one can at least tell a story that might make this plausible. But that's not enough. What about those traits that don't even benefit our relatives differentially? For example, a general altruism toward all members of our species. Why are we good to strangers? For this, the sociobiologist provides the theory of so-called reciprocal altruism. The argument is that even if we're unrelated, if I do you a favor that costs me something, you'll remember that favor and you'll reciprocate in the future. And by this completely indirect path, I'll succeed in advancing my own reproduction. An example often given is that of the drowning person. I see someone drowning. I jump in to save that person even at the risk of my own life. But in the future, when I'm drowning, that person will remember and will save me. And by this indirect path, I'll increase my own probability of survival and reproduction over the long run.
Uh, the problem with this story is, of course, that the last person in the world I want to depend on to save me when I'm drowning is someone whom I had to save in the past, since he or she is not likely to be a very strong swimmer. The real difficulty with this process of explanation is that one can make up a story that will explain the natural selective advantage of any trait that one sees. Combining individual selective advantage with the possibility of kin selection and with reciprocal altruism, it's hard to imagine any human trait for which I could not invent a plausible scenario for its selective advantage. The real problem is, how do we find out whether any of these stories is true? We must distinguish between plausible stories, things that might be true, and true stories, things that have actually happened. How do we know that human altruism arose because of kin selection? or reciprocal altruistic selection. At the very minimum, we might ask whether there's any evidence that such selective processes are going on at the present. But in fact, no one's ever asked that question. No one has ever measured in any human population the actual reproductive advantage or disadvantage of any human behavior. All of the sociobiological explanations of the evolution of human behavior are like Rudyard Kipling's Just So stories of how the camel got his hump and how the elephant got his trunk. They are just stories. Science has been turned into a game, and anyone can play it. Let me illustrate the entire process by two cases. One is meant only fancifully by sociobiologists as a teaching exercise, but one they take very seriously. The fanciful one concerns the problem of why children hate spinach and why adults like it. I didn't make this case up out of my head, it's contained in a high school textbook written by a sociobiologist in order to train children in this kind of thinking. Why do children hate spinach? Well, first, we have the question of description. Is it really true that children hate spinach? Of course it's true. The students only have to look around them and ask their friends. Moreover, when we look around, we find that adults eat spinach. How has this happened? First, let's imagine that there's a gene that has the property that it causes children to hate spinach, but allows adults to like it. Note, there's no evidence for such a gene. We simply suppose there is one. Now, it is a fact that spinach contains a substance called oxalic acid that interferes with the absorption of calcium, which young children do indeed need for their growing bones. So, any child in the past who had the wrong gene and who ate spinach would have had defective growth, would have got rickets, and might not have lived or left many offspring. On the other hand, adults' bones have stopped growing, so calcium is not so important to them. And they are free to take advantage of the nutrients in spinach, and so there's no selection against their liking it. As a consequence, the story goes, it's a part of genetically determined human nature that children have come to hate spinach and adults have come to like it. We have here a completely articulated story of a claimed universal fact of human nature. We should not let the silliness of this case distract us from its essential features. It's meant to teach students all the elements of a naturalistic argument about human nature. It makes a generalized observation by looking around. It postulates genes without any evidence, and then it tells a plausible, or perhaps not so plausible, story. Let's see how this is applied to a serious case, and one that's widely discussed by sociobiologists, namely the existence in human societies of homosexuality. Homosexuality is claimed to be a biological problem by sociobiologists because, after all, since homosexuals leave no offspring, the genes for homosexuality should have long ago disappeared. Why haven't they? First, the sociobiologist makes the assumption that homosexuals leave fewer offspring. This implies a description of human sexual behavior in which the world is divided neatly between heterosexuals and homosexuals one class of which leaves all the children and the other class leaving none. This, however, does not happen to correspond to our knowledge about human sexuality. In fact, the world is not divided between two classes of sexual behavior. On the contrary, there is a continuum of sexuality from persons who have never engaged in anything but heterosexual behavior through those who have a somewhat wider range of experiences through those who are regularly bisexual to those who are, in fact, totally homosexual. If we're to believe a number of surveys, about half of all the males in North America have had at least one homosexual contact. Moreover, the range of sexual behaviors in males and females has varied historically by social class. 
There was widespread bisexuality among males in the upper classes in classical Roman Greece. And indeed, what were the usual homosexual practices then were very different from present practices. Curiously enough, there's not an iota of evidence about the relative reproductive rates of people who are totally heterosexual as opposed to those who have a broader range of sexual experience. So, for example, we don't know whether a person who's heterosexual in, say, 40% of his or her encounters and homosexual in, say, 60% has fewer or more children than people who are totally heterosexual. Indeed, I could make an argument that bisexuality simply is a manifestation of greater general libido, and it might turn out that bisexual people leave more offspring. We simply don't know the answer because no one has ever tried to find out. Second, what's the evidence that there are any genetic differences between individuals according to their sexual preference? Absolutely none. If it were really true, by the way, that homosexuals left no offspring, then there might be a certain problem in studying the heritability of homosexual behavior. Of course, no one has ever tried to do this. So the claims for genetic predisposition to different forms of sexuality are pure fancy. Finally, we have the problem of the evolutionary story. The one told by sociobiologists is the story of helpers at the nest. According to them, homosexuals in the past did not themselves leave any offspring, but they helped their heterosexual brothers and sisters to raise more children by sharing resources with them. And this compensation was more than sufficient to keep the genes for homosexuality in the population. We must remember that they must help their brothers and sisters so well that those relatives would have twice as many offspring as usual. What's the evidence for helpers at the nest in human societies? You won't be surprised to find that there isn't any. Certainly not for our remote prehistoric ancestors, who are after all prehistoric. And if those ancestors are anything like modern hunting and gathering people, a general sharing of resources is a very common phenomenon, not only within the family, but within the entire village, and does not require helpers at the nest. But irrespective of any evidence about the past, what do we know about the relative number of offspring left by people at present who have homosexual brothers and sisters? Nothing. There is no evidence. No one has ever actually measured family size in relation to this question. Thus, the entire discussion of the evolutionary basis of human sexual preference is a made-up story from beginning to end. Yet, it's a story that appears in textbooks, in courses in universities and high schools, on questions of biology and human nature, and in popular books, journals, television, and radio programs. It bears the legitimacy given to it by famous professors and by national and international media. It has the authority of science. Critics of sociobiology might say that it's bad science because there are no facts and only fanciful stories. But in an important sense, sociobiology is science because science consists not simply of a collection of true facts about the world, but is a collection of assertions and theories made by people who call themselves scientists. It consists in large part of what scientists say about the world, whatever the true state of the world might be. Science is not simply an institution devoted to the manipulation of the physical world. It also has as a function the formation of people's consciousness about the political and social world. Science in that sense is part of the general sphere of education, and the assertions of scientists are the basis for a great deal of the educational enterprise, the enterprise of forming people's consciousness. Education in general, and scientific education in particular, is meant not only to make us competent to manipulate the world, but it is meant to help form our social attitudes. No one saw this more clearly and was more open and honest about it than one of the most conservative political figures in American history, Daniel Webster, who said, education is a wise and liberal form of police by which property and life and the peace of society are secured. The 1990 Massey Lectures, presented by Richard C. Lewinton, conclude tomorrow night on Ideas.